Veni, veni, he manu he, captivum solve isa he, qui gemit in exilio. Welcome to the twelfth day of Craftlet, our twelve-day Christmas story extravaganza. Well, today is Christmas Day, and I'm pretty much just bringing you a jumble of Christmas stories that I liked that didn't particularly seem to fit anywhere else, but are definitely applicable to the season. So, congratulations, you made it through another. Now you can relax and have somebody else do the work of reading for you as you stick a good book in your ear. You take care, enjoy the stories. And we will be back with Anne of Green Gables in late January 2018. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you are too. Here we go. An Old Fashioned Christmas by Richard Marsh An Old Fashioned Christmas. A lively family will accept a gentleman as paying guest to join them in spending an old-fashioned Christmas in the heart of the country. That was the advertisement. It had its points. I was not sure what in this case an old-fashioned Christmas might happen to mean. I imagine there were several kinds of old-fashioned Christmases, but it could hardly be worse than a chop in my chambers, or horror of horrors at the club, or my cousin Lucy's notion of what she calls the festive season. Festive? Yes, she and her husband, who suffers from melancholia, and all the other complaints which flesh is heir to, and I dragging through what I call a patent medicine dinner, and talking of everybody who is dead and gone, or else going, and of nothing else. So I wrote to the advertiser. The reply was written in a sprawling feminine hand. It was a little vague. It appeared that the terms would be five guineas, but there was no mention of the length of time which that fee would cover. I might arrive, it seemed, on Christmas Eve, but there was no hint as to when I was to go, if ever. The whole thing was a trifle odd. There was nothing said about the sort of accommodation which would be provided, nothing about the kind of establishment which was maintained, or the table which was kept. No references were offered or asked for. It was merely stated that we're a very lively family, and that if you're lively yourself you'll get on uncommonly well. The letter was signed Madge Wilson. Now it is a remarkable thing that I have always had an extraordinary predilection for the name Madge. I do not know why. I have never known a Madge, and yet from my boyhood upward I have desired to meet one. Here was an opportunity offered. She was apparently the careworn mother of a lively family. Under such circumstances she was hardly likely to be lively herself. But her name was Madge, and it was the accident of her Christian name which decided me to go. I had no illusions. No doubt the five guineas were badly wanted. Even a lively family would be hardly likely to advertise for a perfect stranger to spend Christmas with them if they were not. I did not expect a princely entertainment. Still, I felt that it could hardly be worse than a chop or cousin Lucy. The subjects of her conversation I never cared about when they were alive, and I certainly do not want to talk about them now they are dead. As for the pills and drops with which her husband doses himself between the courses, it makes me ill even to think of them. On Christmas Eve the weather was abominable. All night it had been blowing and raining. In the morning it began to freeze. By the time the streets were like so many skating rinks, it commenced to snow. And it kept on snowing. That turned out to be quite a record in the way of snowstorms. 
hardly the sort of weather to start for an unknown destination in the heart of the country. But at the last moment I did not like to back out. I said I would go, and I meant to go. I had been idiot enough to load myself with a lot of Christmas presents, without the faintest notion why. I had not given a Christmas present for years. There had been no one to give them to. Lucy cannot bear such trifling, and her husband's only notion of a present at any time was a gallon jar of somebody's stomach-stirrer. I am no dealer in poisons. I knew nothing of the people I was going to. The youngest member of the family might be twenty, or the oldest ten. No doubt the things I had bought would be laughed at. Probably I should never venture to offer them. Still, if you have not tried your hand at that kind of thing for ever so long, the mere act of purchasing is a pleasure. That is a fact. I had never enjoyed shopping so much since I was a boy. I felt quite lively myself as I mingled with the Christmas crowd, looking for things which might not turn out to be absolutely preposterous. I even bought something for Madge, I mean Mrs. Wilson. Of course I knew that I had no right to do anything of the kind, and was aware that the chances were a hundred to one against my ever presuming to hint at its existence. I was actually ass enough to buy something for her husband, two things indeed, alternatives as it were, a box of cigars, if he turned out to be a smoker, and a case of whisky if he didn't. I hoped to goodness that he would not prove to be a hypochondriac, like Lucy's husband. I would not give him pills. What the lively family would think of a perfect stranger, arriving burdened with rubbish, as if he had known them all their lives, I did not dare to think. No doubt they would set him down as a lunatic right away. It was a horrible journey. The trains were late and, of course, overcrowded. There was enough luggage in our compartment to have filled it, and still there was one more passenger than there ought to have been, an ill-conditioned old fellow who wanted my hat-box put into the van because it happened to tumble off the rack on to his head. I pointed out to him that the rack was specially constructed for light luggage, that a hat-box was light luggage, and that if the train jolted he ought to blame the company, not me. He was impervious to reason. His wrangling and jangling so upset me that I went past the station at which I ought to have changed. Then I had to wait three-quarters of an hour for a train to take me back again, only to find that I had missed the one I intended to catch. So I had to cool my heels for two hours and a half, in a wretched cow-shed amidst a bitter whirling snowstorm. It is some satisfaction for me to be able to reflect that I made it warm for the officials, however cold I might have been myself. When the train did start some forty minutes after scheduled time, it jolted along in a laborious fashion, at the rate of about six miles an hour, stopping at every roadside hovel. I count it seven in a distance, I am convinced, of less than twenty miles. When at last I reached Crofton, my journey's end, it turned out that the station staff consisted of a half-witted individual who was station-master, porter, and clerk combined, and a hulking lad who did whatever else there was to do. No one had come to meet me. The village was about half a mile, and Hangar Dean, the house for which my steps were bent, about four miles by the road. How far it was across ploughed fields my informant did not mention. There was a trap at the boy and blunderbuss, but that required fetching. Finally the hulking lad was dispatched. It took him some time, considering the distance was only about half a mile. When the trap did appear it looked to me uncommonly like an open spring-cart. In it I was deposited with my luggage. 
The snow was still descending in whirling clouds. Never shall I forget the drive in that miserable cart, through the storm and those pitch-black country lanes. We had been jogging along some time before the driver opened his mouth. "'Be you going to stop with a Wilsons?' "'I am.' "'Aye!' There was something in the tone of his eye which whetted my curiosity near the end of my tether, though I was. "'Why do you ask?' "'It be about time as someone were to stay with them as were a bit capable-like. I did not know what he meant. I did not ask. I was beyond it. I was chilled to the bone, wet, tired, hungry. I had long been wishing that an old-fashioned Christmas had been completely extinct before I had thought of adventuring in quest of one. Better Cousin Lucy's notion of the festive season. We passed through a gate, which I had to get down to open, along some sort of avenue. Suddenly the cart pulled up. "'Here we be!' That might be so. It was a pity he did not add where here was. There was a great shadow, which possibly did duty for a house. But if so, there was not a light in any of the windows, and there was nothing visible in the shape of a door. The whereabouts of this, however, the driver presently made clear. "'There be at the door in front of you. You go up three steps if you can find em. There's a knocker if none of em haven't twisted it off. If they have, there's a bell on your right, if it isn't broken.' There appeared to be no knocker, though whether it had been twisted off was more than I could say. But there was a bell, which creaked with rust, though it was not broken. I heard it tinkle in the distance, no answer, though I allowed a more than decent interval. "'Better ring again,' suggested the driver. "'Hard. Maybe they're up to some of their games, and wants rousing.' Was there a chuckle in the fellow's voice? I rang again, and again, with all the force I could. The bell reverberated through what seemed like an empty house. "'Is there no one in the place?' "'They're there right enough. "'Where's another thing? "'Maybe on the roof or in the cellar. "'If they know you're coming, "'perhaps they hear and don't choose to answer. "'Better ring again.' "'I sounded another peal. "'Presently feet were heard advancing along the passage, "'several pairs, it seemed, "'and a light gleamed through the window over the door. "'A voice inquired, "'Who's there?' "'Mr. Christopher, from London.' The information was greeted with what sounded uncommonly like a chorus of laughter. There was a rush of retreating feet, an expostulating voice, then darkness again, and silence. "'Who lives here? Are the people mad? While thereabouts?' Once more I suspected the driver of a chuckle. My temper was rising. I had not come all that way and subjected myself to so much discomfort to be played tricks with. I told the bell again. After a few seconds' interval, the pit-pat of what was obviously one pair of feet came towards the door. Again a light gleamed through the pane. A key was turned, a chain unfastened, bolts withdrawn. It seemed as if someone had to drag a chair forward before one of these latter could be reached. After a vast amount of unfastening, the door was opened, and on the threshold there stood a girl, with a lighted candle in her hand. The storm rushed in. She put up her hand to shield the light from danger. "'Can I see Mrs. Wilson? I'm expected. I'm Mr. Christopher from London.' "'Oh!' That was all she said. I looked at her, she at me. The driver's voice came from the background. "'I drove him over from the station, miss. There be a lot of luggage. He do say he's come to stay with you.' "'Is that you, Tidy? I'm afraid I can offer you nothing to drink. We've lost the key of the cellar, and there's nothing out. 
except water, and I don't think you'd care for that. I can't say rightly as how I should, miss. Next time we'll do. Be it all right? The girl continued to regard me. Perhaps you'd better come inside. I think I had. I went inside. It was time. Have you any luggage? I admitted that I had. Perhaps it had better be brought in. Perhaps it had. Do you think that you could manage tidy? The mare she'll stand still enough. I should think I could, miss. By degrees my belongings were borne into the hall, hidden under an envelope of snow. The girl seemed surprised at their number. The driver was paid, the cart disappeared, the door was shut, the girl and I were alone together. We didn't expect that you would come. Not expect me? But it was all arranged. I wrote to say that I would come. Did you not receive my letter? We thought that you were joking. Joking? Why should you imagine that? We were joking. You were? Then I am to gather that I have been made the subject of a practical joke, and that I am an intruder here? Well, it's quite true that we did not think you were in earnest. You see, it's this way. We're alone. Alone? Who are we? Well, it will take a good while to explain, and you look tired and cold. I am both. Perhaps you're hungry? I am. I don't know what you can have to eat, unless it's tomorrow's dinner. Tomorrow's dinner? I stared. Can I see Mrs. Wilson? Mrs. Wilson? That's Mamma. She's dead. I beg your pardon. Can I see your father? Oh, father's been dead for years. Then to whom have I the pleasure of speaking? I'm Madge. I'm mother now. You are mother now? The trouble will be about where you are to sleep, unless it is with the boys. The rooms are all anyhow, and I'm sure I don't know where the beds are. I suppose there are servants in the house? She shook her head. No, the boys thought that they were nuisances, so we got rid of them. The last went yesterday. She wouldn't do any work, so we thought she'd better go. Under those circumstances I think it probable that you were right. Then am I to understand that there are children? Rather. As she spoke there came a burst of laughter from the other end of the passage. I spun round. No one was in sight. She explained. They are waiting round the corner. Perhaps we'd better have them here. You people, you'd better come and let me introduce you to Mr. Christopher. A procession began to appear from round the corner of boys and girls. In front was a girl of about sixteen. She advanced with outstretched hand and an air of self-possession, which took me at a disadvantage. "'I'm Bessie. I'm sorry we kept you waiting at the door, but the fact is that we thought it was Eliza's brother who had come to insult us again.' "'Pray don't mention it. I'm glad that it was not Eliza's brother.' "'So am I. He's a dreadful man.' I shook hands with the rest of them. There were six more, four boys and two girls. They formed a considerable congregation as they stood eyeing me with inquiring glances. Madge was the first to speak. I wondered all along if he would take it as a joke or not. And you see, he hasn't. I thought all the time that it was a risky thing to do. I like that. You keep your thoughts to yourself then. It was you proposed it. You said you'd been reading about something of the kind in a story, and you voted for our advertising ourselves for a lark. The speaker was the biggest boy, a good-looking youngster, with sallow cheeks and shrewd black eyes. But, Rupert, I never meant it to go so far as this. How far did you mean it to go, then? It was your idea all through. You sent in the advertisement, you wrote the letters, and now he's here. If you didn't mean it, why didn't you stop his coming? Rupert! The girl's cheeks were crimson. 
Bessie interposed. The thing is that, as he is here, it's no good worrying about whose fault it is. We shall simply have to make the best of it. Then to me. I suppose you really have come to stay? I confess that I had some notion of the kind to spend an old-fashioned Christmas. At this there was laughter, chiefly from the boys. Rupert exclaimed, A nice sort of old-fashioned Christmas you'll find it will be. You'll be sorry you came before it's through. I'm not so sure of that. There appeared to be something in my tone which caused a touch of silence to descend upon the group. They regarded each other doubtfully, as if in my words a reproof was implied. Bessie was again the spokeswoman. Of course, now that you have come, we mean to be nice to you, that is, as nice as we can, because the thing is that we are not in a condition to receive visitors. Do we look as if we were? To be frank, they did not. Even Madge was a little unkempt, while the boys were in what I believe is the average state of the average boy. "'And,' murmured Madge, "'where is Mr. Christopher to sleep?' "'What is he to eat?' inquired Bessie. She glanced at my packages. "'I suppose you have brought nothing with you?' "'I'm afraid I haven't. I had hoped to have found something ready for me on my arrival.' Again they peeped at each other as if ashamed. Madge repeated her former suggestion. "'There's tomorrow's dinner.' "'Oh, hang it!' exclaimed Rupert. "'It's not so bad as that. There's a ham.' "'Uncooked!' "'You can cut the steak off, or whatever you call it, and have it broiled.' A meal was got ready in the preparation of which every member of the family took a hand, and a room was found for me, in which was a blazing fire and traces of recent feminine occupation. I suspected that Madge had yielded her own apartment as a shelter for the stranger. By the time I had washed and changed my clothes, the impromptu dinner or supper, or whatever it was, was ready. A curious repast it proved to be composed of oddly contrasted dishes, cooked and sometimes uncooked in original fashion. But hunger, that piquant sauce, gave it a relish of its own. At first no one seemed disposed to join me. By degrees, however, one after another found a knife and fork, until all the eight were seated with me round the board, eating, some of them, as if for dear life. "'The fact is,' explained Rupert, we're a rum lot. We hardly ever sit down together. We don't have regular meals, but whenever anyone feels peckish, he goes and gets what there is, and cooks it and eats it on his own. It's not quite so bad as that, protested Madge, though it's pretty bad. It did seem pretty bad from the conventional point of view. From their conversation, which was candor itself, I gleaned details which threw light upon the peculiar position of affairs. It seemed that their father had been dead some seven years. Their mother, who had been always delicate, had allowed them to run nearly wild. Since she died some ten months back, they appeared to have run quite wild. The house, with some six hundred acres of land, was theirs, and an income as to whose exact amount no one seemed quite clear. "'It's about eight hundred a year,' said Rupert. "'I don't think it's quite so much,' doubted Madge. "'I'm sure it's more,' declared Bessie. "'I believe we're being robbed.' I thought it extremely probable. They must have had peculiar parents. Their father had left everything absolutely to their mother, and the mother in her turn everything in trust to Madge, to be shared equally among them all. Madge was an odd trustee. In her hands the household had become a republic, in which everyone did exactly as he or she pleased. The result was chaos. No one wanted to go to school, so no one went. The servants, finding themselves provided with eight masters and mistresses, followed their example, and did as they liked. Consequently, after sundry battles royal, 
Lively episodes some of them had evidently been, one after the other had been got rid of, until now not one remained. Plainly the house must be going to rack and ruin. "'But have you no relations?' I inquired. Rupert answered, "'We've got some cousins or uncles or something of the kind in Australia, where, so far as I'm concerned, I hope they'll stop.' When I was in my room, which I feared was Madge's, I told myself that it was a queer establishment on which I had lighted. Yet I could not honestly affirm that I was sorry I had come. I had lived such an uneventful and such a solitary life, and had so often longed for someone in whom to take an interest, who would not talk medicine chest, that to be plunged all at once into the centre of this troop of boys and girls was an accident which, if only because of its novelty, I found amusing. And then it was so odd that I should have come across a match at last. In the morning I was roused by noises, the cause of which at first I could not understand. By degrees the explanation dawned on me. The family was putting the house to rights, a somewhat noisy process it seemed. Someone was singing, someone else was shouting, and two or three others were engaged in a heated argument. In such loud tones was it conducted that the gist of the matter travelled up to me. "'How do you think I am going to get this fire to burn, if you beastly kids keep messing it about? It's no good banging at it with a poker till it's alight.' The voice was unmistakably Rupert's. There was the sound of a scuffle, cries of indignation, then a girlish voice pouring oil upon the troubled waters. Presently there was a rattle and clatter, as if someone had fallen from the top of the house to the bottom. I rushed to my bedroom door. "'What on earth has happened?' A small boy was outside, Peter. He explained, "'Oh, it's only the broom and dustbun gone tobogganing down the stairs. It's Bessie's fault. She shouldn't leave them on the landing.' Bessie, appearing from a room opposite, disclaimed responsibility. "'I told you to look out where you were going, but you never do. I'd only put them down for a second while I went in to empty a jug of water on to Jack, who won't get out of bed, and there are all the boots for him to clean.' Injured tones came through the open portal. "'You wait, that's all. I'll soak your bed tonight. I'll drown it. I don't want to clean your dirty boots. I'm not a shoe-black. The breakfast was a failure. To begin with, it was inordinately late. It seemed that a bath was not obtainable. I had been promised some hot water, but as I waited and waited, and none arrived, I proceeded to break the ice in my jug. It was a bitterly cold morning, nice old-fashioned weather, and to wash in the half-frozen contents. As I am not accustomed to perform my ablutions in partially dissolved ice, I fear that the process did not improve my temper. It was past eleven when I got down, feeling not exactly in a Christmassy frame of mind. Everything and everyone seemed at sixes and sevens. It was afternoon when the breakfast appeared. The principal dish consisted of eggs and bacon, but as the bacon was fried to cinders, and the eggs all broken, it was not so popular as it might have been. Madge was moved to melancholy. "'Something will have to be done. We can't go on like this. We must have someone in to help us.' Bessie was sarcastic. "'You might give Eliza another trial. She told you if you didn't like the way she burnt the bacon, to burn it yourself, and as you followed her advice, she might be able to give you other useful hints on similar lines. Rupert indulged himself in the same vein. Then there's Eliza's brother. He threatened to knock your blooming head off for saying Eliza was dishonest, just because she collared everything she laid her hands on. He might turn out a useful sort of creature to have about the place. 
"'It's all very well for you to laugh, but it's beyond a jest. I don't know how we're going to cook the dinner.' "'Can I be of any assistance?' I inquired. First of all, what is there to cook? It seemed that there were a good many things to cook. A turkey, a goose, beef, plum pudding, mince pies, custard, sardines. It seemed that Molly, the third girl, as she phrased it, could live on sardines, and esteemed no dinner a decent dinner at which they did not appear, together with a list of etceteras half as long as my arm. One thing is clear. You can't cook all those things today. We can't cook anything. This was Rupert. He was tilting his chair back and had his face turned towards the ceiling. Why not? Because there's no coal. No coal? There's about half a scuttle full of dust. If you can make it burn, you'll be clever. What Rupert said was correct. Madge confessed with crimson cheeks that she had meant, over and over again, to order some coal, but had continually forgotten it, until finally Christmas Day had found them with an empty cellar. There was plenty of wood, but it was not so dry as it might have been, and anyhow the grate was not constructed to burn wood. "'You might try smoked beef,' suggested Rupert. When that wood goes at all, it smokes like one o'clock. If you hung the beef up over it, it would be smoked enough for any one by the time that it was done. I began to rub my chin. Considering the breakfast we had had, from my point of view the situation commenced for the first time to look really grave. I wondered if it would not be possible to take the whole eight somewhere where something really eatable could be got but when I broached the subject I learned that the thing could not be done. The nearest hostelry was the boy and blunderbuss, and it was certain that nothing eatable could be had there, even if accommodation could be found for us all. Nothing in the shape of a possible house of public entertainment was to be found closer than the market town, eight miles off. It was unlikely that even there a Christmas dinner for nine could be provided at a moment's notice. Evidently the only thing to do was to make the best of things. When the meeting broke up, Madge came and said a few words to me alone. "'I really think you had better not stay. Does that mean that you had rather I went?' "'No, not exactly that.' "'Then nearly that?' "'No, not a bit that.' Only you must see for yourself how awfully uncomfortable you'll be here, and what a horrid house this is. My dear Madge, everybody called her Madge, so I did, even if I wanted to go, which I don't, and I would remind you that you contracted to give me an old-fashioned Christmas. I don't see where there is that I could go. Of course, there's that. I don't see either so I suppose you'll have to stay. But I hope you won't think that I meant you to come to a place like this. Really, you know. I'm sorry. I had hoped you had. That's not what I mean. I mean that if I had thought that you were coming, I would have seen that things were different. How different? I assure you that things as they are have a charm of their own. That's what you say. You don't suppose that I'm so silly as not to know you're laughing at me. But as I was the whole cause of your coming, I hope you won't hate the others because of me. She marched off, brushing back with an impatient gesture some rebellious locks which had strayed upon her forehead. That Christmas dinner was a success, positively of a kind, let that be clearly understood. I am not inferring that it was a success from the point of view of a chef de cuisine. Not at all. How could it be? Quite the other way. By dint of ransacking all the rooms and emptying all the scuttles, we collected a certain amount of coal, with which, after adding a fair proportion of wood, we managed. 
not brilliantly, but after a fashion. I can only say, personally, I had not enjoyed myself so much for years. I really felt as if I were young again. I'm not sure that I'm not younger than I thought I was. I must look the matter up. And after all, even if one be, say, forty, one need not be absolutely an ancient. Madge herself said that I had been like a right hand to her. She did not know what she would have done without me. Looking back, I cannot but think that if we had attempted to prepare fewer dishes, something might have been properly cooked. It was a mistake to stuff the turkey with sage and onions, but as Bessie did not discover that she had been manipulating the wrong bird until the process of stuffing had been completed, it was felt that it might be just as well to let it rest. Unfortunately, it turned out that some thyme, parsley, mint, and other things had got mixed up with the sage, which gave the creature quite a peculiar flavor. But as it came to table nearly raw, and as tough as hickory, it really did not matter. My experience of that day teaches me that it is not easy to roast a large goose on a small oil stove. The dropping fat caused the flame to give out a strong smelling and a most unpleasant smoke. Rupert, who had charge of the operation, affirmed that it would be all right in the end. But by the time the thing was served, it was as black as my hat. Rupert said that it was merely brown, but the brown was of a sooty hue, and it reeked of paraffin. We had to have it deposited in the ash bin. I dare say that the beef would not have been bad if someone had occasionally turned it, and if the fire would have burned clear. As it was, it was charred on one side and raw on the other, and smoked all over. The way in which the odor and taste of smoke permeated everything was amazing. The plum pudding came to the table in the form of soup, and the mince pies were nauseous. Something had got into the crust, or mincemeat or something, which there, at any rate, was out of place. Luckily we came upon a tin of corned beef in a cupboard, and with the aid of some bread and cheese and other odds and ends we made a sort of picnic. Incredible though it may seem, I enjoyed it. If there was anywhere a merrier party than we were, I should like to know where it was to be found. It must have been a merry one. When I produced the presents in which a happy inspiration had urged me to invest, the enthusiasm reached a climax. I believe that is the proper form of words which I ought to use. As I watched the pleasure of those youngsters, I felt as if I were myself a boy again. That was my first introduction to a lively family. They came up to the description they had given of themselves. I speak from knowledge, for they have been my acquaintances now some time. More than acquaintances, friends, the dearest friends I have. At their request I took their affairs in hand, Madge informally passing her trusteeship on to me. Things are very different with them now. The house is spick and span. There is an excellent staff of servants. Hanger Dean is as comfortable a home as there is in England. I have spent many a happy Christmas under its hospitable roof since then. The boys are out in the world after passing with honor through school and college. The girls are going out into the world also. Bessie is actually married. Madge is married too. She is Mrs. Christopher. That is the part of it all which I find is hardest to understand, to have told myself my whole life long that the name of my ideal woman would be Madge, and to have won that woman for my own at last. That is greater fortune than falls to the lot of most men. I thought that I was beyond that kind of thing that I was too old, but Madge seemed to think that I was young enough, and she thinks so still. And now there is a little Madge, 
who is big enough to play havoc with the sheets of paper on which I have been scribbling, to whom one day this tale will have to be told. A Christmas Mystery, the Story of Three Wise Men, by William J. Locke. Three men, who had gained great fame and honour throughout the world, met unexpectedly in front of the bookstall at Paddington Station. Like most of the great ones of the earth, they were personally acquainted, and they exchanged surprised greetings. Sir Angus McCurdy, the eminent physicist, scowled at the two others beneath his heavy black eyebrows. "'I'm going to a godforsaken place in Cornwall called Trehenna, said he. "'That's odd, so am I.' croaked Professor Biggleswade. He was a little untidy man, with round spectacles, a fringe of greyish beard, and a weak, rasping voice, and he knew more of Assyriology than any man living or dead. A flippant pupil once remarked that the professor's face was furnished with a Babylonic cuneiform in lieu of features. "'People call Deverill foolish castle?' asked Sir Angus. "'Yes,' replied Professor Biggleswade. "'How curious! I'm going to the Deverills, too,' said the third man. This man was the Right Honourable Viscount Doyne, the renowned empire-builder and administrator, around whose solitary and remote life popular imagination had woven many legends. He looked at the world through tired grey eyes, and the heavy, drooping, blonde moustache seemed tired, too, and had dragged down the tired face into deep furrows. He was smoking a long black cigar. "'I suppose we may as well travel down together,' said Sir Angus, not very cordially. Lord Doyne said courteously, "'I have a reserved carriage. The railway company is always good enough to place one at my disposal.' It would give me great pleasure if you would share it. The invitation was accepted, and the three men crossed the busy, crowded platform to take their seats in the great express train. A porter, laden with an incredible load of paraphernalia, trying to make his way through the press, happened to jostle Sir Angus McCurdy. He rubbed his shoulder fretfully. Why, the whole land should be turned into a bear garden on account of this exploded superstition of Christmas is one of the anomalies of modern civilization. Look at this insensate welter of fools travelling in wild hearts to disgusting places merely because it's Christmas. You seem to be travelling yourself, McCurdy, said Lord Doyne. Yes, and why the devil I'm doing it I've not the faintest notion, replied Sir Angus. It's going to be a beast of a journey, he remarked some moments later, as the train carried them slowly out of the station. The whole country is under snow, and as far as I can understand, we had to change twice and wind up with a twenty-mile motor drive. He was an iron-faced, beetle-browed, stern man, and this morning he did not seem to be in the best of tempers. Finding his companions inclined to be sympathetic, he continued his lamentation. "'And merely because it's Christmas, I've had to shut up my laboratory and give my young fools a holiday, just when—' I was in the midst of a most important series of experiments. Professor Biggleswade, who had heard vaguely of and rather looked down upon such new-fangled toys as radium and thorium and helium and argon, for the latest astonishing developments in the theory of radioactivity had brought Sir Angus McCurdy his worldwide fame, said somewhat ironically, if the experiments were so important, why didn't you lock yourself up with your test-tubes and electric batteries and finish them alone? Man, said McCurdy, bending across the carriage and speaking with a curious intensity of voice, do you know I'd give a hundred pounds to be able to answer that question? 
"'What do you mean?' asked the professor, startled. "'I should like to know why I'm sitting in this dumb train "'and going to visit a couple of addled-headed society people "'whom I'm scarcely acquainted with, "'when I might be at home in my own good company "'furthering the progress of science.' "'I myself,' said the professor, "'am not acquainted with them at all.' It was Sir Angus McCurdy's turn to look surprised. "'Then why are you spending Christmas with them?' "'I reviewed a ridiculous blank verse tragedy, written by Deverill, on the death of Sennacherib. Historically it was puerile. I said so in no measured terms. He wrote a letter claiming to be a poet and not an archaeologist, I replied that the day had passed when poets could, with impunity, commit the abominable crime of distorting history. He retorted with some futile argument, and we went on exchanging letters, until his invitation and my acceptance concluded the correspondence. McCurdy, still bending his black brows on him, asked him why he had not declined. The professor screwed up his face till it looked more like a cuneiform than ever. He, too, found the question difficult to answer, but he showed a bold front. "'I felt it my duty,' said he, "'to teach that preposterous ignoramus something worth knowing about Sennacherib. Besides, I am a bachelor, and would sooner spend Christmas—' as to whose irritating and meaningless annoyance I cordially agree with you, among strangers than among my married sister's numerous and nerve-wracking families. Sir Angus McCurdy, the hard, metallic apostle of radioactivity, glanced for a moment out of the window at the grey, frost-bitten fields. Then he said, "'I'm a widower.' My wife died many years ago, and thank God we had no children. I generally spend Christmas alone. He looked out of the window again. Professor Biggleswade suddenly remembered the popular story of the great scientist's antecedents, and reflected that as McCurdy had once run a barefoot urchin through the Glasgow mud, he was likely to have little kiss or kin. He himself envied McCurdy. He was always praying to be delivered from his sisters and nephews and nieces, whose embarrassing demands no calculated coldness could repress. "'Children are the root of all evil,' said he. "'Happy the man who has his quiver empty.' Sir Angus McCurdy did not reply at once. When he spoke again, it was with reference to their prospective host. "'I met Deverell,' said he, "'at the Royal Society Soiree this year. One of my assistants was demonstrating a peculiar property of thorium, and Deverell seemed interested. I asked him to come to my laboratory the next day, and found he didn't know a damn thing about anything. That's all the acquaintance I have with him.' Lord Doyne, the great administrator, who had been wearily turning over the pages of an illustrated weekly, chiefly filled with flamboyant photographs of obscure actresses, took his gold glasses from his nose and the black cigar from his lips, and addressed his companions. "'I've been considerably interested in your conversation,' said he, "'and as you've been frank, I'll be frank, too. I knew Mrs. Deverell's mother, Lady Carstairs, very well years ago, and, of course, Mrs. Deverell when she was a child. Deverell I came across once in Egypt. He had been sent on a diplomatic mission to Tehran. As for our being invited on such slight acquaintance, little Mrs. Deverell has the reputation of being the only really successful celebrity hunter in England. She inherited the faculty from her mother, who entertained the whole world. We are sure to find archbishops and eminent actors, 
and illustrious divorcees asked to meet us. That's one thing. But why I, who loathe country-house parties and children and Christmas as much as Biggleswade, am going down there to-day? I can no more explain than you can. It's a devilish odd coincidence. The three men looked at one another. Suddenly McCurdy shivered and drew his fur coat around him. Oh, thank you, said he, to shut that window. It is shut, said Doyne. It's just uncanny, said McCurdy, looking from one to the other. What? asked Doyne. Nothing, if you didn't feel it. There did seem to be a sudden draught, said Professor Biggleswade, but as both window and door are shut, it could only be imaginary. It wasn't imaginary, muttered McCurdy. Then he laughed harshly. My father and mother came from Cromarty, he said with apparent irrelevance. That's the Highlands, said the professor. Aye said McCurdy. Lord Doyne said nothing, but tugged at his moustache and looked out of the window as the frozen meadows and bits of river and willows raced past. A dead silence fell on them. McCurdy broke it with another laugh and took a whisky flask from his handbag. Have a nip? Thanks, no, said the professor. I have to keep to a strict dietary and I only drink hot milk and water, and of that sparingly. I have some in a thermos bottle. Lord Doyne also declining the whisky, McCurdy swallowed a dram and declared himself to be better. The professor took from his bag a foreign review, in which a German sciolist had dared to question his interpretation of a Hittite inscription. Over the man's ineptitude he fell asleep, and snored loudly. To escape from his immediate neighbourhood, McCurdy went to the other end of the seat and faced Lord Doyne, who had resumed his gold glasses and his listless contemplation of obscure actresses. McCurdy lit a pipe, Doyne another black cigar. The train thundered on. Presently they all lunched together in the restaurant car. The windows steamed, but here and there, through a white patch of pane, a white world was revealed. The snow was falling. As they passed through Westbury, McCurdy looked mechanically for the famous white horse carved into the chalk of the down, but it was not visible beneath the thick covering of snow. "'It'll be just like this all the way to Gehenna, Trehenna, I mean,' said McCurdy. Doyne nodded. He had done his life's work amid all extreme fiercenesses of heat and cold, in burning droughts, in simoons, and in icy wildernesses, and a ray or two more of the pale sun, or a flake or two more of the gentle snow of England, mattered to him but little. But Biggleswade rubbed the pane with his table-napkin, and gazed apprehensively at the prospect. "'If only this wretched train would stop! said he, I would go back again. And he thought how comfortable it would be to sneak home again to his books, and thus elude not only the Deverals, but the Christmas jollities of his sister's families, who would think him miles away. But the train was timed not to stop till Plymouth, two hundred and thirty-five miles from London, and thither was he being relentlessly carried. Then he quarrelled with his food, which brought a certain consolation. The train did stop, however, before Plymouth, indeed before Exeter. An accident on the line had dislocated the traffic. The express was held up for an hour, and when it was permitted to proceed, instead of thundering on, it went cautiously, subject to continual stoppings. It arrived at Plymouth two hours late. The travellers learned that they had missed the connection on which they had counted, and that they could not reach Trehenna till nearly ten o'clock. 
After weary waiting at Plymouth, they took their seats in the little, cold, local train that was to carry them another stage on their journey. Hot water cans put in at Plymouth mitigated to some extent the iciness of the compartment, but that only lasted a comparatively short time, for soon they were set down at a desolate, shelterless wayside junction, dumped in the midst of a hilly, snow-covered waste, where they went through another weary wait for another dismal local train that was to carry them to Trehenna. And in this train there were no hot water cans, so that the compartment was as cold as death. McCurdy fretted and shook his fist in the direction of Trehenna. "'And when we get there we have still a twenty miles motor drive to Foolis Castle. It's a fool name, and we're fools to be going there.' "'I shall die of bronchitis,' wailed Professor Biggleswade. "'A man dies when it is appointed for him to die,' said Lord Doyne, in his tired way, and he went on smoking long black cigars. "'It's not the dying that worries me,' said McCurdy. "'That's a mere mechanical process which every organic being from a king to a cauliflower has to pass through. It's the being forced against my will and my reason to come on this accursed journey, which something tells me will become more and more accursed as we go on, that is driving me to distraction. "'What will be will be,' said Doyne. "'I can't see where the comfort of that reflection comes in,' said Biggleswade. "'And yet you've travelled in the east,' said Doyne. "'I suppose you know the Valley of the Tigris as well as any man living.' "'Yes,' said the Professor. "'I can say I dug my way from Tikrit to Baghdad, and left not a stone unexamined.' "'Perhaps, after all,' Doyne remarked, "'that's not quite the way to know the East.' "'I never wanted to know the modern East,' returned the Professor. What is there in it of interest compared with the mighty civilizations that have gone before? McCurdy took a pull from his flask. I'm glad I thought of having a refill at Plymouth, said he. At last, after many stops at little lonely stations, they arrived at Trehenna. The guard opened the door, and they stepped out onto the snow-covered platform. An oil lamp hung from the tiny penthouse roof that structurally was Trehenna Station. They looked around at the silent gloom of white, undulating moorland, and it seemed a place where no man lived and only ghosts could have a bleak and unsheltered being. A porter came up and helped the guard with the luggage. Then they realised that the station was built on a small embankment, for, looking over the railing, they saw below the two great lamps of a motor-car. A fur-clad chauffeur met them at the bottom of the stairs. He clapped his hands together and informed them cheerily that he had been waiting for four hours. It was the bitterest winter in these parts within the memory of man, said he, and he himself had not seen snow there for five years. Then he settled the three travellers in the great roomy touring-car, covered with a cape-cart hood, wrapped them up in many rugs, and started. After a few moments, the huddling together of their bodies, for the professor being a spare man, there was room for them all on the back seat, the pile of rugs, the serviceable and all but airtight hood, induced a pleasant warmth and a pleasant drowsiness. Where they were being driven they knew not. The perfectly upholstered seat eased their limbs, the easy swinging motion of the car soothed their spirits. They felt that already they had reached the luxuriously appointed home, which, after all, they knew awaited them. McCurdy no longer railed. Professor Biggleswade forgot the dangers of bronchitis, and Lord Doyne twisted the stump of a black cigar between his lips without any desire to relight it. A tiny electric lamp inside the hood 
made the darkness of the world to right and left, and in front of the talc windows, still darker. McCurdy and Biggleswade fell into a doze. Lord Doyne chewed the end of his cigar. The car sped on through an unseen wilderness. Suddenly there was a horrid jolt, and a lurch, and a leap, and a rebound, and then the car stood still, quivering like a ship that has been struck by a heavy sea. The three men were pitched and tossed and thrown sprawling over one another onto the bottom of the car. Biggleswade screamed, McCurdy cursed. Doyne scrambled from the confusion of rugs and limbs, and tearing open the side of the Cape Cart hood, jumped out. The chauffeur had also just leapt from his seat. It was pitch dark, save for the great shaft of light down the snowy road cast by the acetylene lamps. The snow had ceased falling. "'What's gone wrong?' "'It sounds like the axle,' said the chauffeur ruefully. He unshipped a lamp and examined the car, which had wedged itself against a great drift of snow on the off-side. Meanwhile, McCurdy and Biggleswade had alighted. "'Yes, it's the axle,' said the chauffeur. "'Then we're done,' remarked Doyne. "'I'm afraid so, my lord.' "'What's the matter? Can't we get on?' asked Biggleswade in his querulous voice. McCurdy laughed. "'How can we get on with a broken axle? The thing's as useless as a man with a broken back. Gad, I was right!' I said it was going to be an infernal journey. The little professor wrung his hands. But what's to be done? he cried. Tramp it, said Lord Doyne, lighting a fresh cigar. It's ten miles, said the chauffeur. It would be the death of me, the professor wailed. I utterly refuse to walk ten miles through a polar waste with a gouty foot, McCurdy declared wrathfully. The chauffeur offered a solution of the difficulty. He would set out alone for Foolish Castle. Five miles farther on was an inn where he could obtain a horse and trap, and would return for the three gentlemen with another car. In the meanwhile they could take shelter in a little house which they had just passed some half-mile up the road. This was agreed to. The chauffeur went on cheerily enough with a lamp, and the three travellers, with another lamp, started off in the opposite direction. As far as they could see, they were in a long, desolate valley, a sort of no-man's land, deathly silent. The eastern sky had cleared somewhat, and they faced a loose rack through which one pale star was dimly visible. "'I'm a man of science,' said McCurdy as they trudged through the snow, and I dismiss the supernatural as contrary to reason, but I have highland blood in my veins that plays me exasperating tricks. My reason tells me that this place is only a commonplace moor, yet it seems like a valley of bones haunted by malignant spirits who have lured us here to our destruction. There's something guiding us now. It's just uncanny. Why on earth did we ever come? croaked Biggleswade. Lord Doyne answered, The Koran says nothing can befall us but what God hath destined for us. So why worry? Because I'm not a Mohammedan, retorted Biggleswade. You might be worse said Doyne. Presently the dim outline of the little house grew perceptible. A faint light shone from the window. It stood unfenced by any kind of hedge or railing, a few feet away from the road in a little hollow beneath some rising ground. As far as they could discern in the darkness when they drew near, the house was a mean, dilapidated hovel. A guttering candle, stood on the inner sill of the small window, and afforded a vague view into a mean interior. Doyne held up the lamp, so that its rays fell full on the door. As he did so, 
an exclamation broke from his lips, and he hurried forward, followed by the others. A man's body lay huddled together on the snow by the threshold. He was dressed like a peasant in old corduroy trousers and a rough coat, and a handkerchief was knotted round his neck. In his hand he grasped the neck of a broken bottle. Doyne set the lamp on the ground, and the three bent down together over the man. Close by the neck lay the rest of the broken bottle, whose contents had evidently run out into the snow. "'Drunk?' asked Biggleswade. Doyne felt the man, and laid his hand on his heart. "'No,' said he. "'Dead.' McCurdy leapt to his full height. "'I told you the place was uncanny,' he cried. "'It's Fay. Then he hammered wildly at the door. There was no response. He hammered again till it rattled. This time a faint, prolonged sound, like the wailing of a strange sea creature, was heard from within the house. McCurdy turned round, his teeth chattering. "'Did ye hear that, Doyne?' "'Perhaps it's a dog,' said the professor. Lord Doyne, the man of action, pushed them aside and tried the door-handle. It yielded, the door stood open, and the gust of cold wind entering the house extinguished the candle within. They entered, and found themselves in a miserable stone-paved kitchen, furnished with poverty-stricken meagreness. A wooden chair or two, a dirty table, some broken crockery, old cooking utensils, a fly-blown missionary society almanac, and a fireless grate. Doyne set the lamp on the table. "'We must bring him in,' said he. They returned to the threshold, and as they were bending over to grip the dead man, the same sound filled the air, but this time louder more intense, a cry of great agony. The sweat dripped from McCurdy's forehead. They lifted the dead man and brought him into the room, and after laying him on a dirty strip of carpet, they did their best to straighten the stiff limbs. Biggleswade put on the table a bundle which he had picked up outside. It contained some poor provisions, a loaf, a piece of fat bacon, and a paper of tea. As far as they could guess, and as they learned later they guessed rightly, the man was the master of the house, who, coming home blind drunk from some distant inn, had fallen at his own threshold and got frozen to death. As they could not unclasp his fingers from the broken bottleneck, they had to let him clutch it, as a dead warrior clutches the hilt of his broken sword. Then, suddenly, the whole place was rent with another and yet another long, soul-piercing moan of anguish. "'There's a second room,' said Doyne, pointing to a door. "'The sound comes from there.' He opened the door, peeped in, and then, returning for the lamp, disappeared, leaving McCurdy and Biggleswade in the pitch darkness with the dead man on the floor. "'For heaven's sake! "'Give me a drop of whisky," said the professor, "'or I shall faint.' Presently the door opened, and Lord Doyne appeared in the shaft of light. He beckoned to his companions. "'It is a woman in childbirth,' he said, in his even, tired voice. "'We must aid her. She appears unconscious. Does either of you know anything about such things?' They shook their heads, and the three looked at each other in dismay. Masters of knowledge that had won them worldwide fame and honour, they stood helpless, abashed before this, the commonest phenomenon of nature. "'My wife had no child,' said McCurdy. "'I've avoided women all my life,' said Biggleswade. "'And I've been too busy to think of them.' "'God forgive me,' said Doyne. "'The history of the next two hours "'was one that none of the three men "'ever cared to touch upon. "'They did things blindly, 
instinctively, as men do when they come face to face with the elemental. A fire was made, they knew not how. Water drawn, they knew not whence, and a kettle boiled. Doyne, accustomed to command, directed, the others obeyed. At his suggestion, they hastened to the wreck of the car, and came staggering back beneath rugs and travelling bags which could supply clean linen and needful things, for, amid the poverty of the house, they could find nothing fit for human touch or use. Early they saw that the woman's strength was failing, and that she could not live. And there, in that nameless hovel, with death on the hearthstone, and death and life hovering over the pitiful bed, the three great men went through the pain and the horror and squalor of birth. And they knew that they had never yet stood before so great a mystery. With the first wail of the newly born infant, a last convulsive shudder passed through the frame of the unconscious mother. Then three or four short gasps for breath, and the spirit passed away. She was dead. Professor Biggleswade threw a corner of the sheet over her face, for he could not bear to see it. They washed and dried the child, as any crone of a midwife would have done, and dipped a small sponge which had always remained unused in a cut-glass bottle in Doyne's dressing-bag, in the hot milk and water of Biggleswade's thermos-bottle, and put it to his lips. And then they wrapped him up warm in some of their own woollen undergarments, and took him into the kitchen, and placed him on a bed made of their fur coats in front of the fire. As the last piece of fuel was exhausted, they took one of the wooden chairs, and broke it up and cast it into the blaze. And then they raised the dead man from the strip of carpet, and carried him into the bedroom, and laid him reverently by the side of his dead wife, after which they left the dead in darkness, and returned to the living. And the three grave men stood over the wisp of flesh that had been born a male into the world. Then, their task being accomplished, reaction came. And even Doyne, who had seen death in many lands, turned faint. But the others, losing control of their nerves, shook like men stricken with palsy. Suddenly McCurdy cried in a high-pitched voice, "'My God! Don't you feel it?' and clutched Doyne by the arm. An expression of terror appeared on his iron features. "'There! It's here with us!' Little Professor Biggleswade sat on a corner of the table and wiped his forehead. "'I heard it. I felt it. It was like the beating of wings.' "'It's the fourth time,' said McCurdy. "'The first time was just before I accepted the Deverell's invitation. The second in the railway carriage this afternoon. The third on the way here.' This is the fourth. Bigglesweed plucked nervously at the fringe of whisker under his jaws, and said faintly, It's the fourth time up to now. I thought it was fancy. I have felt it too, said Doyne. It is the angel of death. And he pointed to the room where the dead man and woman lay. For God's sake, let us get away from this cried Biggleswade. "'And leave the child to die like the others?' said Doyne. "'We must see it through,' said McCurdy. A silence fell upon them as they sat round in the blaze, with the newborn babe, wrapped in its odd swaddling clothes, asleep on the pile of fur coats, and it lasted until Sir Angus McCurdy looked at his watch. "'Good Lord!' said he. "'It's twelve o'clock!' "'Christmas morning,' said Biggleswade. "'A strange Christmas,' mused Doyne. "'McCurdy put up his hand. "'There it is again! 
the beating of wings! And they listened like men spellbound. McCurdy kept his hand uplifted and gazed over their heads at the wall, and his gaze was that of a man in a trance, and he spoke, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Doyne sprang from his chair, which fell behind him with a crash. Man, what the devil are you saying? Then McCurdy rose, and met Biggleswade's eyes staring at him through the great round spectacles. And Biggleswade turned and met the eyes of Doyne. A pulsation, like the beating of wings, stirred the air. The three wise men shivered with a queer exultation. Something strange, mystical, dynamic had happened. It was as if scales had fallen from their eyes, and they saw with a new vision. They stood together humbly, divested of all their greatness, touching one another in the instinctive fashion of children, as if seeking mutual protection, and they looked with one accord, irresistibly compelled, at the child. At last McCurdy unbent his black brows and said hoarsely, "'It was not the angel of death, Doyne, but another messenger that drew us here.' The tiredness seemed to pass away from the great administrator's face, and he nodded his head with the calm of a man who has come to the quiet heart of a perplexing mystery. "'It's true.' he murmured. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, unto the three of us. Biggleswade took off his great round spectacles and wiped them. Gaspar, Melchior, Balthazar. But where are the gold, frankincense, and myrrh? In our hearts, man, said McCurdy. The babe cried and stretched its tiny limbs. Instinctively they all knelt down together to discover, if possible, and administer ignorantly to its wants. The scene had the appearance of an adoration. Then these three wise, lonely, childless men, who in furtherance of their own greatness had cut themselves adrift from the sweet and simple things of life, and from the kindly ways of their brethren, and had grown old in unhappy and profitless wisdom, knew that an inscrutable providence had led them, as it had led three wise men of old on a Christmas morning long ago, to a nativity which should give them a new wisdom, a new link with humanity a new spiritual outlook, a new hope. And when their watch was ended, they wrapped up the babe with precious care, and carried him with them, an inalienable joy and possession, into the great world. If you like what you hear, please leave us a review on iTunes, like us on Facebook. You can download our app for iOS devices, Android devices, Windows phones. You can listen to Craftlet on Stitcher Radio, iHeartRadio, Google Play Music. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. <laughs>